He's impressed all that have seen him so far. Plenty of pace. James Michael Anderson, Burnley, born and bred, announced himself to the cricketing public in the summer of 2002, when as a 19-year-old he made his debut for Lancashire with immediate success. Well, superb start for Anderson. Chris Taylor goes for a duck. He wasn't expecting that sort of bounce from this flat pitch. Bob Willis wasn't the only one who was impressed with Anderson's ability to swing the ball at genuine pace. And that winter, despite having only played five one-day games, he was summoned from the academy to join up with England for a one-day series against Australia and Sri Lanka in preparation for the 2003 World Cup. And he's got his wickets for James Anderson. It's his first international scalp. That tournament was held in South Africa. And on the evening of February the 22nd, 2003, Anderson produced two successive balls which marked him out as a star of the future. Beautifully bowled, wonderfully bowled by James Anderson. Inzamam has gone from his first delivery. Oh, beautifully bowled. Beautifully bowled by James Anderson. What a moment for him. Inspired by the young Anderson, England went on to win the game and a painfully shy Jimmy was trotted out for an early taste of what would become a major part of his life, the media. He was swinging uh, for, the, for the Pakistanis early doors, um, and then we got it to swing for about 20 overs there, if not more, um, and we, we had their batters in trouble. So what was the plan, to put it right up there in that driving range for that ball to swing and maybe initiate some edges? Yeah, um, we, had, we spoke about the team last night, um, all, we went through all their batters, and we said that if it's swinging, uh, pitch it up there, uh, maybe up, uh, chuck in the odd Yorker uh, and they'll be in trouble. Cricket, as we all know, can be a harsh mistress. And eight days later, Anderson tasted the other side of the game when Andy Bickle carted him for a six. That's it, that's a big hit. It's six. That's a big, big six. And a four. That's nicely placed as well. Andy Caddick's gonna, it's gonna beat him. That's four. As Australia, needing 14 from the final two overs, dumped England out of the competition. Despite that disappointment, Jimmy was now very much on England's radar, and three months later, he was given his test cap at Lords for the first test of the summer against Zimbabwe. Not the start that Anderson has wanted, short and wide outside off stump. After a shaky start, his first over went for 17. He responded with figures of 5 for 73. It's all over now. That's the end of the innings. James Anderson has finished with a bang. Five wickets for him. And when he added another six in the next test in Durham, he was well on his way to what would be a record-breaking haul of test match wickets. Yeah! He's dragged that one on. That's fine bowling from James Anderson. It was easy to forget, however, that at this stage, Anderson was still very much a novice. He'd only played a grand total of 17 games of first-class cricket by the time he made his test debut. It was hardly a surprise then that when South Africa, led by a run-hungry Graham Smith, arrived for the second half of the summer of 2003, Jimmy, sporting a rather startling red streak in his hair, suddenly found life a whole lot tougher. Smith's got it away through the offside. Giles is after it from the gully. He can't get there, though. That's another Smith boundary. And this is not an impressive opening spell from Anderson so far. Anderson's arrival in the England test side coincided with the appointment of Troy Cooley as England's bowling coach. And it wasn't long before the Australian, with a passion for biomechanics, started to try and change Anderson's action, which, with its unique dip of the head at the moment of delivery, was far from classical, was identified as being likely to cause injury. The action, though, was entirely natural for Jimmy, and Cooley's attempt to alter it appeared to have a detrimental effect, as Anderson seemed to lose his way. He was the young kid coming through, had to force his way in. So we did, had to do a lot of work, bowling in nets, bowling to cones, you know, to try and keep, and he hasn't got the, the, the biggest attention span. He does throw the toys out of the cot quite regularly, so trying to keep him motivated to bowl at cones and nets, and that was hard. With tough love backing like that from the coaches, it was only to be expected that Anderson would later admit he found this period of his career very tough. 
Yeah, it was really tough. Um, going through, you know, um, getting dropped in and out of the team, uh, injuries. Uh, my action was all over the shop and uh, it was difficult. Yeah, it was, it was hard to, to try and deal with. And I think that those moments are when you, you do a lot of, of thinking, soul searching yourself um, and trying to find that mental toughness to get yourself back, back to the top. Despite his impressive start, Anderson was now way down the pecking order when it came to England's seam bowling options. And with a succession of injuries also taking their toll, the remodelled action didn't stop those. It's got him. That is the wicket that might uh, change James Anderson's fortunes. It's a very good catch. His appearances in an England test shirt were sporadic. Indeed, in the five-year period between May 2003, when he made his debut, and March 2008, he only played 20 tests. I had a stress fracture in 2006, and coming back from that, that's when I worked with Mike Watkinson, who was coach at Lancashire at the time, Kevin Shine, who was uh, working with England at the time, and the three of us came together with the, the plan of going back to my old action, you know, some, an action that I was comfortable with, and um, we focused more on my skills with the ball, swinging the ball, rather than actual speed, because I've always been able to bowl 85 miles an hour plus. It worked, and when on the tour of New Zealand in 2008, England lost the first test badly, Anderson's career was ready for a relaunch. Hoggard and Harmison were left out and Anderson and another young bowler by the name of Stuart Broad were given the chance of extended runs in the side. The pair of them would go on to play over 120 tests together for their country and form one of English cricket's most enduring and lethal partnerships, taking in excess of 900 wickets between them when playing together. We've worked well together, we, we bounce off each other well and when one of us is kind of down, it, we can the other one picks him up, so it's kind of, it's worked well for us and, and understanding each other and, and what our jobs are in the team I think is important. As Anderson settled into his role as the leader of England's attack, the milestones started to flash by. At the Oval in 2008, Callis became his 100th test victim. Ah! Oh, Pat first out, yes, the finger goes up, the in-swinger from Anderson. Callis didn't pick it, he's gone. Two years later, he was past 200. Outside edge, I'm gone. 200 test wickets now for James Anderson, and it was a beauty. By 2015, he had doubled that, and in doing so, had gone past Ian Botham's record for an Englishman in test cricket. Got him. That's what England have been waiting for. That's what Jimmy Anderson has been waiting for. He now becomes England's leading wicket taker of all time in test matches. 26 games later, he was past 500. Yeah, it's an elite club, and Anderson's just joined it. And when he bowled Mohamed Shami in September 2018... Oh, England have won the Test match. Anderson has the wicket he was prizing. He'd taken 564 wickets, more than Glenn McGrath, and more than any other seamer in the history of the game.